It's 5.30. I'll call the meeting to order. And if everyone could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, thank you everyone for, for coming tonight and joining in either on Facebook or by audio. Um, our first order of business tonight will be the adoption of the agenda. Commissioners, have you had a chance to review the agenda? And do you have any modifications or, or changes? I have none. I have none, Mayor. Okay. If there's no modifications, then I'll entertain a motion. I make a motion that we adopt the agenda. Second. A okay, motion and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Uh, appointments, Planning Commission, Board of Zoning Appeals has one expired term. Tonight I'd like to appoint Rachel Lyons to the expired term. So uh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Consent agenda. There were no modifications, so I'll entertain a motion for the consent agenda. I move we accept the consent agenda as presented. Second. A motion as second has been given. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Items for commission action. Item A, consider a request to hold a drive-through job fair on May 27th, 2020 from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Park Oval. Kansas Works to hold this job fair as a drive-through. Um, they will have their employees in masks and take all safety precautions and just be handing bags bags of information to job seekers. And um, so that is the extent of their request. It's on the 27th from 10 to 2. I checked with Barb and there's no conflicts. So this isn't a request to block the oval just for them is it just to set up and utilize the space it at would the same be time? the same way they do the drive through <clears throat> flu shot so whatever setup they do for that that would be the same setup okay so the park will remain open during yes. those hours yes okay. commissioners any questions commissioner sissy have any questions uh, no, the, my only question would be the people, they will remain in their cars and they'll just yes. basically the be Yes, the job seekers will be in the cars and the workers for Kansas Works will be handing them items. Okay. And this Hayes. is uh, just in anticipation of uh, possibly having congestion uh, associated with this and perhaps slower travel times around the Oval perhaps. Yes, um, originally they wanted to do it at Memorial Hall, but I was concerned that was stacked traffic into the highway. Mm. This allows more room to stack vehicles, and so that is why we recommended that. I anticipate you're probably gonna have the same amount of participation as you do for the flu shots and things like that, and it seems to work well. Does that back up then into the city streets uh, outside of the park? I don't believe so. Uh, I don't know if Barb's on the line and she might be able to comment to that. Barb, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. I don't I don't foresee. I don't know how many they're really expecting, but there's plenty of room to uh, park the cars around the park uh, road. I think for the flu shot, they set up on the north uh, northeast area near uh, the covered little building, the concession stand or the band stand over in there, so they have the stack room on the, the west side and on up by the shelter house. That makes sense. That's all my questions. Any further questions, commissioners? I have none. If there are no further questions, then I'll entertain a motion. 
I make a motion that we move to approve a request from Kansas Works to hold a drive-through job fair on May 27, 2020 from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Park Oval. I second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Item B, consider an ordinance expanding the sale at retail of cereal malt beverages and alcoholic liquor on Sundays. Mayor, this was previously brought to the commission and, and it was indicated by the commission if we had um, interest from businesses to place this back on the agenda that it would be reconsidered. In our uh, community pandemic meetings, one of the things that we talk about is uh, the businesses and the economic impact and things like that. And it was brought to our attention that that, that was a concern of some of our businesses that had lost revenue during the pandemic to make up that additional revenue potentially by being able to be open on Sundays. So I got with Jeff and uh, he worked on an ordinance for us and we placed this back on the agenda. Now since then we have heard, heard some concerns from other business owners who you know, have a different opinion on that, and I believe a couple of those are here to speak to you tonight. Okay. Um, with that, commissioners, why don't we uh, allow the public to to speak? We have a request from uh, Patrick Conway. Would you want to address the commission at this time? Commissioners, thanks for, for having everybody up here today to talk about this. You know, this is something that, that me and Michelle have talked about at length. Um, you know, in general, you know, we all, I think all of us that, that own uh, liquor stores here in town have lived here for a long time. And, you know, one of the concerns that I have is, and that me and Michelle have, is, you know, how much, how much leakage are we having from not being open on Sundays? Um, you know, when I think about it, me and Michelle talked is when when a customer goes to a liquor store to get to get alcohol, you know, I would assume that they're they're gonna go either go get something from Walmart or go to the grocery store or go go out to eat or go get gas. Um, if we're not available and open on Sundays, then it's likely you know they're gonna go somewhere to get it. Um, you know, every town around us um, allows Sunday sales. Um, you know, with with what's happened in just the last hour or so, um, I know Governor Kelly's put out a um, another uh, what is it um, part of the reopening 1.5 kind of backing off a little bit. So there's a lot going on, you know, in the country overall. And you know, the way me and Michelle view this is if if we have the data to support that there is that much leakage going outside of Independence, people leaving and going and spending their money on Sundays, then why not be open? But at the same time, with everything else going on, it's it's hard to take that step and say, yes, let's go ahead and open up on Sunday. You know, I haven't I haven't seen any data from that yet. It's been kind of hard to find, um, but uh, you know we view business in general as being open, being available when people need us there. If that means that we have to be open on Sundays, we'll be open on Sundays. If we can't be open on Sundays, we won't open on Sundays. E either way, um, you know, we, we can see a benefit both ways. Um, would we like to open on Sundays? I think so. Um, you know, I think that if if we do open on Sundays and then we don't see the sales, we don't have to be open on Sundays. This allows us the opportunity to be open on Sundays. Um, you know, if we if it gets approved to open on Sundays and we open up and we're losing money or not having any traffic or, you know, then we'll close on Sundays. You know, but not having the option is was our, our number one concern is because right now we can't. Um, you know, they allow Sunday sales for liquor and restaurants. Um, and I don't know, 
I don't know if this would include, by approving this, if this would include being able to open bars on Sundays that don't sell food. I'm not sure, I, I don't remember, but um, you know, there is a lot going on right now in the state and in the country, and there's a lot to consider going into this. Um, you know, I think that, you know, taking into consideration everything that's going on, um, we can really see it both sides. Um, we can make it work one way or the other. Um, you know, I think that if, if if it's approved, like I said, if it's approved, we open up and we're not seeing the sales, we won't open on Sundays. Um, if it's not approved, then we'll hopefully readjust, address it sometime in the future when we see some more data or proof that, that people are, are leaving town because liquor stores aren't open. Um, I, I, you know, our customers that we talk to of course, are just liquor store. They just customers come in. You know, you ask them, do you do you want us to be open on Sunday? Of course they do. Um, but that general that that population is is small compared to everybody in town. So, you know, some to so definitely something to consider and think about. And you know, I know uh, me and Michelle appreciate you having us up here to to talk about our feelings about it and hope uh, hope we make the the right decision. So, thank you. Thank well, you, thank Pat. you for coming, Pat. Oh. Did you have any other questions before I step down? Forgot to ask you that. Have any questions, Commissioner Hayes? I do not. Commissioner Yusissi? No. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Okay. The next, uh, Mike Borvitz <coughs> has requested to address the commission. I'm Mike Borvetz. I'm with Borvetz Liquor Store. Uh, I've also visited with Doug Parham and Jeremy Hallett of Mikey's Liquor and Hallett's Liquor uh, regarding this subject, and they've asked me to speak for them as well. Uh, as I discussed with each one of you last night, uh, as, as we found out about the ordinance being put before you tonight for consideration, uh, we've got some serious concerns with this. Uh, and, and as we discussed, uh, people have been ingrained uh, for years, in, in my lifetime, you don't buy alcohol on Sunday in Independence, Kansas. Uh, and for many years, it was that way statewide. We understand that some of the communities around us have opened that up where they do allow that. But what we do know and what our data suggests from from our business, and a lot of us have been in business for many years, everybody knows and they're trained, they're, they're gonna buy their beer and their liquor on Fridays and Saturdays in anticipation of Sunday. Now certainly some people could run out of beer on Sunday, and I'm sure that there are a few people that, that leave this town to go buy some beer, or go buy a bottle of wine or whatever the case may be on a Sunday because that option is not available in Independence today. However, we're already capturing those sales. What we would gain is, is not going to offset the additional overhead that we're going to encounter by having to be open an extra day. So what we'll see is our Friday sales and our Saturday sales decline just to capture that same amount of sales on Sunday with the additional overhead. Uh, we, we've already seen about a 15% reduction in our revenues based on the law change to last April, uh, allowing strong beer to be sold in liquor store or in Walmart and grocery stores and convenience stores. They're already open. They already have that overhead. That they're gonna be selling toilet paper and, and spaghetti and everything else on Sunday, whether they're selling beer or not. Us, on the other hand, we're, we're not organized by the same laws that they are. We don't have those opportunities. So this would just create an additional burden for us. If I can answer any questions for you, I'd be happy to. Commissioners, have any questions for Mike? I, I might have uh, some. Uh, Mike, you and your family have been in business here in Independence for many years. When, when did you start Borovet's Liquor? 1980. 1980. And so the, you've seen changes in the Kansas statutes associated with uh, liquor sales over that period of time. That is correct. This, this last one has been particularly harmful to your business as it has um, 
taken away certain, uh, I guess, a protected class of, of alcoholic beverages and uh, spread them out a, over a broader number of competitors. The, uh, the sale of hard beer or high alcohol content beer in all the other um, convenience stores, grocery stores, and other outlets. Yeah, is that, that's, that's is, is correct. That the, that's the 15% impact you were talking about earlier. Yes, yes. Now, the, the state has allowed some, uh, some conditions that we can supplement some of that, but you have to understand that when the laws were put into effect, uh, the way that the liquor stores had to organize, that's all they could ever be. Uh, so when they've eased a few of those restrictions, unfortunately, when we, when we laid out the money to put in our infrastructure to build our facilities, we, we weren't set up to be able to expand of that nature, to have some of those other offerings. And we certainly can't operate like Walmart, even if we had the room to expand and wanted to make that investment. We can't do it. The, the law still don't allow for that. Uh, we can't sell gas. We, we can't do a lot of things that they can do. So we understand the way the laws are, um, but we also understand this is not going to create anything positive for our businesses uh, between the, the Four liquor stores in this town. We employ over 15 people. Um, this is our only source of revenue as business owners. Uh, many of these people, this is their only income as jobs. And by doing this, and and if, if the ordinance were to go through, we really have no option but to be open because our, our customers are creatures of habit, and and they they get used to shopping at one location to buy their alcohol. Uh, and then if you start Putting in, put yourself in a situation that you're not available to make those sales that you're already making today, um, you have a chance of potentially losing that customer altogether. Are you familiar with the uh, liquor stores in, let's say, uh, Coffeeville? Yeah, you, I, uh, am. You, uh, I am. I am. Um, knowledge and relationship with those. How has this uh, change that Coffeeville went to, and I don't remember how long ago it was that they allowed Sunday sales. So when the, when the state came through and said, okay, we're gonna authorize it at the state level, but we're gonna send it to the counties. The counties then took and said, we're gonna authorize it, as Montgomery County did, said, but we're gonna send it to each one of the communities for them to approve on their own. You know, Coffeeville is a border town um, and at the time that, that they started and began selling, there, there was a strong demand from Oklahoma to come buy strong beer because Oklahoma did not have that available. So by being open on Sunday and them being right there on the, on the Oklahoma border, they were gaining traffic that way. Uh, I haven't talked to them about um, what they're experiencing today, but in October, Oklahoma changed their laws and offer heavy beer throughout the state. So I would, I would say that they're probably lost a lot of the sales and a lot of the reasons and the demand for them to be open on Sundays uh, when Oklahoma changed their laws. So the laws in, are changing not only in Kansas but in Oklahoma that, uh, That's right. that uh, you really had built your business model around and now those laws are changing. That's right. And I anticipate that you, or I would, guess that you would anticipate further change coming in the future? You know, we, we don't know. It's, it's always a possibility, um, particularly with the Walmarts that are very powerful and, and have lobbyists at, at very high levels. I know that they want a bigger footprint and a, a bigger piece of that pie. And I'm sure they're not done working on it, um, but we're, we're not aware of anything today. But it is certainly possible that we could see additional change that would have further impacts on our business. Well, you, have, you are living in a changing environment, and uh, it's, it's been hard on you the last uh, a few, few, few months as yeah. the laws have changed and those uh, beer sales have become more distributed amongst uh, other business entities, so uh, it's been hard. That is correct. And, and unfortunately, I wish I could tell you something different, but these sales, they exist in our stores, um, every liquor store in this town, um, they have Sunday customers they are getting them on Saturday or Friday. Now, if, if you really look at the population, Independence is about 9,000 people. 
All right, if we say half of those, that number is adults that could walk into a liquor store and buy a liquor, that's 4,500 people. Um, I, I've heard the half million dollars thrown out uh, for the leakage that's occurring because of Sunday liquor sales. Um, I, I find it hard to believe that 4,500 people would leave this community on a Sunday to go buy alcohol. Uh, even if that number was more realistic, say 10%, that's 450 people. Uh, I, I, I don't believe there's 450 people leaving this community every Sunday to go buy beer as a re reason why they're leaving. Uh, they're probably going for other reasons. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, that there aren't some people that run out of beer on Saturday night that was intended for Sunday and say, hey, we want some more beer to watch the game with. And then they may drive, drive to Coffee Village and Yoda Shea to go buy that beer, but they're coming home. It's, it's not driving them to go shop. If they're going shopping, they're shopping for a different reason. So thinking back over the year and a, year and a half, after the, the law changed, uh, how rapidly did you begin to notice the the loss of business to uh, to other beer vendors? It, it happened pretty immediately. I, I would say within the first month, we really f started feeling the sting of it. Wow. That's all my questions. Okay. okay. Commissioner Yusissi. Yeah, Mike, I have a question. Are you familiar with Bly's over at yeah, Neodiche? Yeah, I sure am. How are there? Uh, they're the only liquor store in town, is that right, in Neodiche? I, I think they're the only one up there. I, I do believe so. Okay. Well, what are there? Um, have you talked to them? I, I have not talked to, talked to her. Um, I mean, we, we do periodically. I, I don't know how much they're selling up there on Sundays. I, I really can't tell you that. Uh, and, and because I haven't spoke with them, I, I wouldn't want to even tender a guess on it. Um, you know, this, those smaller communities, I mean, they don't have a Walmart that they have to protect themselves. Um, you know, they, they've opened it up, and, and I know that there are some people that, that have gone up there on Sunday and bought beer. I'm fully aware of that. Um, I, I don't know what portion of their, or a percentage of their business that is driving. Okay, so it's it's your contention then that basically what you see um, with this ordinance um, that it's just going to um, you know like you had said Kansas is pretty well um, the understanding that for as long as I can remember you could you could never buy alcohol on Sunday and and you you were uh, conditioned to buy whatever you needed. Sat Friday, Saturday, or, or whatever, but you bought it at that time. And I understand with the Kansas changing the, the liquor laws, and they've cut into your business with, with that change in April 2019. So your opinion is that you think that the sales would, you're not going to see, an, you're just going to see sales basically spread out. You, That's right. You're having what, a hard time understanding yeah, what, what, where there would be I, I don't losses because you're just giving people another day an opportunity to buy alcohol. So if they don't actually buy it on Friday or Saturday, they still have an opportunity. They would. They they would. But with that, uh, again, they're they're conditioned for that as well. Uh, if if they have intentions of drinking on Sunday, they <laughs> they know that they better buy enough beer on Saturday or Friday whenever they're it is that they're in the liquor store. I don't think anybody's in there on Saturday saying, well, I'm going to buy some beer today, and I, I, I want to drive to New Odisha tomorrow to go buy some more beer. They'll buy what they, they need if they think that that's what they're going to do on Sunday. Could they run out? Yeah, and, and it does happen. Uh, people don't plan ahead sometimes. Things pop up. But those sales, uh, the, our customers, they, they know to stock up on Friday and Saturday. So we would just see a decline in our sales on Friday and Saturday to ultimately get them back on Sunday with now an additional day of overhead. More payroll, more electric. So you, you, may, you may or may not make them up because if it's Sunday is available with the, the amount of people that are going through Walmart and G and W. That's right. Places that are continually open. That just gives them another step up to 
what we're already here. That's right. Buying other things, and this is, gives us an opportunity to now buy this product that we weren't able to buy um, previously. Yeah, on that, that, Sunday. that's that's so, correct. Absolutely. So you begin to wonder whether the sales are just spread out over multiple places. What what is what is the gain? Who actually gains? That's that's right, and and I don't see that we'll we'll see that gain. And if it is, it would not, it would not likely not offset our overhead that we would encounter. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Mike. All right, appreciate it. Thank you, Mike. This is kind of a unique situation to find a, a community that we can compare with, like uh, was brought out about Coffeeville, the border town having a condition across the line the people would, would come into Coffeeville, so their increased sale would happen initially until the state changed their their ordinances. And Neodache is, is unique in its size. One liquor store, uh, limited number of convenience stores, so it's, it's totally different also. So it's hard to find an exact comparison. Uh, <clears throat> I think when we we look at, at what happened here with the change in the loss of revenue. That that's understandable that you increase the the locations that you can have a choice. And like uh, Commissioner Yususi mentioned, we're already here getting dog food, so I might as well pick up six pack or whatever. That it it, it does offer a a problem when you are limited to the products that you can sell. Um, so tonight uh, we have an opportunity to adopt an ordinance. We have an opportunity to uh, table action. We could uh, set up a, a forum that we could have more one-on-one -on -one conversation with the, the local owner, owners and try and get a better understanding of what they're against to see uh, if there's other options that we haven't considered. Um, so I think at this time, commissioners, what what is your understanding what is what are your thoughts commissioner you see well i had um i had some questions that i had forwarded to um trish and to kelly and uh mike uh, i wanted to to give me an indication of how they uh, how they came up with the leakage the 10 percent the dollar amount and how they arrived at those figures and then i also did some background um, as far as the state of Kansas is concerned, the, uh, the federal and the state excise tax is collected on liquor and wine and beer, beer sales at the liquor store. Uh, the only sales tax that would be, uh, the, the state of Kansas does not, uh, the 6.5 percent does not apply uh, as far as the tax on, on wine, beer, or liquor uh, at the liquor stores. It's, it's a federal and state excise uh, liquor tax that that is collected and it's based on on a gallon of wine gallon of uh, beer and gallon of liquor so you're looking at um, those sales are not uh, generating uh, sales tax revenues to the city of independence now the the strong beer the CMB those would uh, generate sales tax. So my, my thinking here, and, and maybe this follow me along, with an amount of $500,000, that's that's approximate amount that was determined as a 10% leakage. So if we're going to draw 3%, 2% to the city, 1% to the educational sales tax, so we're looking at 3% on five hundred thousand dollars, 
Am I, am I treading the right way or, or no? I, I had. That, that would have a lot of assumptions, though. Right. Uh, assuming that all, so those were for liquor store codes. Um, so that wouldn't capture anyone that's going to a convenience store or a grocery store somewhere outside of Independence to purchase those items. Um, and it, it also doesn't denote that those are Sunday sales at all. That was total, total leakage, so it could have been any day of the week. And it's only those customers going outside of Independence to another liquor store, from what I understand. So it's not specifically tied to any particular day of the week. And then on that, on that form, it indicated um, on the far right-hand corner, it said uh, number of businesses. It indicated three under, so, the, under the title of... So uh, it's picking up three liquor stores is how I understand that. And this is from 2017. So... And we've had an additional liquor store come online since since then. So, so you, what I'm saying is, you can't assume th those are liquor store to liquor store leakage. So, you would not see any sales tax if I go to a liquor store anywhere. Liquor store sales do not generate any sales tax. Mm -hmm. The only way that the city would capture anything is if someone bought it at a, a convenience store or a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And, and this report does not have any indication of how many consumers are purchasing at those outlets. And, and that's what would generate sales tax. Okay. So, so I just, I, you can't say if we got, you know, a percentage of that 500,000, because we, we don't know where they would purchase them. Right. Okay. I had not received response from Trish on your questions. I did for those mm. on tour as well. I responded on mine, but okay. Um, mm. but she's really good at explaining that as well. She's the one that put the report together for us. Okay. Um, I checked prior to the meeting, and, and I had not gotten response from Trish, mm. but I did have some questions that I sent, and, and those were part of them that I brought up here tonight. Mm. Because I, I wanted to see how that was, how they determined that, mm -hmm. and how, uh, just basically, how we got these figures. What are they based on? And I found out a little bit more information tonight from Lacey. Thank you, Lacey. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Hayes. Well, I, I appreciate that we're in a changing economic environment, and I appreciate that COVID-19 is slamming everyone's business and changing the way we look at the world and uh, and that is uh, that is a fact one of the facts that I don't understand and perhaps uh, Kelly you can help me understand this is that a, a ordinance of this kind was put into place originally with some kind of a thought towards the greater good and not what wasn't really targeted to the protection of a business class so if this ordinance was put into place for the protection of the greater good and the uh, uh, the welfare of the citizens in general of the of independence um, I'd like to know why uh, what the logic was behind it at the time that it was enacted uh, the state of Kansas debates this liberally and thoroughly at the state level and passes these restrictions or um, constraints down to the county for uh, for action but uh, to for the city to take it even further as a restriction of uh, of hours or a restriction of commerce and a restraint of trade seems to be a little uh, heavy-handed at this point in our history uh, this is uh, the type of thing that uh, seems to me that we're just adding a, a layer of complexity to what's already a very complex uh, amount of statutes at the state level that has already touched this and, and debated it in almost every facet imaginable. So uh, at some point in time, I'd like to understand why this ordinance was enacted in the first place and to what greater good this was 
originally designed to serve because it seems to me at this point that it is maybe um, times of changing and uh, maybe the greater good is not served by this type of layer, uh, this additional layer of governmental control. So what is your comment on that? Well, you know, there in the past there's been several of those laws that kind of regulate morality in a way. And I would imagine this is one of those that, that was put into effect originally when they restricted the Sunday sales. And since then, you know, the state allowed the cities to be able to open that up. Um, several have jumped on board right away. Um, you know, I think it's just more about consumer choice and what the consumer wants. And, you know, the consumer wants what they want when they want it. And I would anticipate that they probably got some pressure on the state level to open it up. Then it got pushed down to the cities. And then it's just a city by city, you know, choice. And um, as you can see on the, the PowerPoint, there are several cities around us that do allow this already. Um, Cherryville's in process. Their ordinance has been published. They're in that 60-day waiting period. In that 60-day period, if a sufficient protest petition is filed, then it has to go to the vote of the, to the voters. Um, and it's a percentage of who voted in the last presidential election. And so there is a uh, another layer. If 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 the citizens you know did not want this, they do have the option to to file a petition and file that. Um, so there is that other layer as well, and then uh, then it would go into effect if no petition is filed. But, I mean, it's just, we've heard over the years, you know, we've heard it several times, people, you know, especially as the cities around you, then you get more pressure. It's like, oh, how come you can buy it here, but you can't buy it here, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think it's just kind of a, just a change in the times and how people thought about things several years ago and how they think about it now. And so since it was brought up again as um, potentially being an interest of one of the businesses, we brought that forward to you. It seems like the legislature would have been motivated more on the ones that couldn't sell the strong alcoholic, the beer, that they wanted a part of that market, the Walmart, the convenience stores. So you see it phasing in because it wasn't looked at at total. And of course, the trickle down is we'll pass from the state, we'll pass it to the county because then the county can now take the blunt and then the county will we'll pass it to the city so the city can take the blunt of the, the repercussion. Uh, but it, it was, it, and to me, it, it appears that it initiated with the start of uh, a lobbying effort for the larger retail stores to now be allowed to sell <clears throat> the strong uh, malt beverages. And I'm, I'm not familiar with the terms. So I guess there's a cereal malt and then the alcoholic liquor, they're different. And uh, so it would be based upon allowing them to take a part of the market share that they didn't have before. And uh, Mike was explaining, and we did receive a, an email that mentioned, I think, 15% of their business was lost with, with that adoption. Mm -hmm. uh, it makes it, it difficult that we have business owners, local owners that are looking at the increase of overhead to now operate an additional day, the increase of staffing, and that's not going to happen with businesses that are already open on, on Sunday. So, you know, it's it's hard to look at a number of leakage that you don't know how it's determined. You know, I, I know if my 
cars losing oil, there's leakage because there's a spot on the pavement and I can measure how big the oil drip gets and all that. But in, in this, with a number of saying $500,000 a year is lost in, in, in sales annually, I think, man, I didn't know there was that much being spent here annually without the leakage. And it's just hard to comprehend all the, the numbers and, and then still look at, at a decision that we make that affects our business owners particularly because, you know, through this COVID-19, that's been our, our concern is, is how things impact our businesses, uh, the loss of revenue, the loss of hours, and now here we're seeing another action not necessarily tied to COVID, but increasing the market shares, which would reduce their market share and affect them financially. Uh, so this is a, an interesting problem that we're, we're discussing tonight. And there's a lot of information to take into consideration, you know, even if, if we're looking at increased revenue, how much? And, you know, is that worth opening up that revenue to come out of the pocket of our local store owners to go to, to big corporations? So uh, there's a lot to consider as we, we face this topic. And um, I don't know if the commission, do you feel you've had the information to make a decision at this time? Do you want to research the topic further? Do you want additional information? Do you want to have a, just a, not a work session, but a, an open forum that we could have a, a, a dialogue specifically for the topic before we bring it up to a vote? So dealing with, with those thoughts, commissioners, what's your idea? Yeah, I would, I would like to have some more information on some uh, specific questions that I had for Trish mm -hmm. concerning the, the amount of, the dollar amount of leakage, the percentage, <clears throat> and I'd like to have a little more information based on that. I've learned some information here tonight from Lacey okay. about the sales, uh, about, and I, I think that's where I'm going with that. I'd like okay. to hear more. You, Commissioner Yusufi desires additional information. Commissioner Hayes. Uh, I'm leaning that way myself. I'd like more time to consider uh, uh, economic impact. I'd like more time to consider the actual uh, legal ramifications, uh, at least uh, around what the state is actually trying to control here and, and why they're passing this uh, uh, law down to the county, and I haven't re had time to research that. So, yeah, it, either of the options that uh, give us more time to consider the subject. Okay. Um, do the commission desire to have a further dialogue with the business owners, a forum or, or such, or just you want? M my desire is to help, uh, is to get the business owners to help us craft the right. Uh, ordinance for the future, the okay. one that uh, accommodates uh, changing business environments, changing, uh, changing statute requirements, those kinds of things, and, uh, and that would be ideal. To develop a partnership with the businesses so that any modification of our ordinances would not be detrimental but be as a benefit to the whole. Absolutely. Okay. So with that, then... What I'm hearing is the commission desires additional information, which we can uh, submit to Kelly, our request. Kelly would assemble it and then distribute it back to us. Also, the, the, the business owners, if you have information that you feel would be pertinent, if you would send it to Kelly, and then Kelly will distribute it to us also, that way we'll have more information and uh, then 
then we'll, what I'm hearing is, you know, I could make a motion that we table this for now and address it at a later date. So, no. Mayor, if, if you would like to give me the date of when that is, then I could send letters out to all the business owners and make sure that they're aware of when that meeting is. I would suggest doing it next month to give us a plenty of time to give them notice. Yeah, what I would think possibly that we get the information, bring it back where we can discuss the information among ourselves or, you know, we can advertise that if they want to attend, make sure we got all our questions. Okay. And then we'll set a date to reconsider it then. But, you know, um, if, if we could have, you know, two weeks together the information and come back and then set the, the yeah, other day. yeah right that sounds great okay does that sound good yes yep so my motion is we table action and reconsider at a later date to be announced do i have a second second all in favor signify by saying aye aye aye, aye. motion carried I want to thank all of you for coming tonight and and sharing we this is the way government works. We got to have input, and we appreciate you taking your time. So, thank you. You're, we'll move to the next item of considering setting the date of July 23rd, 2020, for a public hearing to consider condemnation of a fire damage structure located at 1033 North 17th Place as dangerous and unsafe. case. Uh, this house was involved in the flood, I believe back in 2018, and had its damage was greater than it put it in the class to where she either had to raise it above the flood stage yeah. or remove it. So she's been working with the state of Kansas. She moved to Oklahoma and her daughter moved in and they had a fire a couple of weeks ago. Well, that fire caused substantial damage to the garage and to the wiring of the house, which is now causing the house to be totally going to need a rewire. She has until August to make a decision with the state of Kansas as to whether she's going to raise the house above the floodplain and all. What she told me yesterday is she's pretty sure that she's going to remove the house but she's working out a few more details with her insurance agent in the state of Kansas. And that if, she, if it isn't removed by the 23rd of July, uh, she will be here to visit with the commission about what her plans are to both meet the floodplain regulation and restore, fix the house, if that's what she decides. So it's, it's kind of a complicated case. <laughs> so. You might explain uh, the FEMA standards if it's flooded and the damage substantial damage above exceeds the, yes certain percentage of the value value of the house yes then action has to be taken taken yes so so that that did occur and she has till August to decide yep and uh, but the fire through another through another kind of monkey in the rent, wrench in the monkey or however that goes. Yeah. And so it's just put her in a <clears throat> quandary. It's been very frustrating with her. Uh, it's been difficult for the family working through FEMA in the state to get all these questions answered. So yeah. she's frustrated, but she's she understands what's going on. And uh, we had a long conversation yesterday and she understands our process uh, at this point where we're at. So she's yeah. good with setting the date, but she hopes to have it removed probably before then is where she's leaning right okay. at this moment. Okay. Commissioners have any question for Dave? I do not. David, on that house, um, from the initial flood in August of 2018, I believe. Yes. So did that house meet, uh, it had to meet 50% or greater damage for FEMA? It's based on what the value, the appraised value right. of the house, uh, she then went out and had estimates of repairs, 
and those repairs were above the value of the appraised value, which kicks her into, uh, you either have to raise it up above the floodplain. I'm not, it gets difficult and I would have to, I mean, really have to have the paper in front of me to go through all sure. that process. But the value, the repairs were more than what the appraised value, so she either has to raise it which now it's two foot above the floodplain, uh, or remove the structure. And it is insured and it was, does have FEMA flood insurance. So that's why she has all these rules that she has to meet too. And she has accepted some money, but there's some money being held till she makes a decision of what she's gonna do. So she has the money to remove it and just, she'll be able to walk, basically walk away from it or meet the FEMA standards and fix it. And the oh. fire just added another layer on sure. top of that. Sure, I, I think I know this lady, and I think I was in the house yep. just a few days after the flooding and had a long conversation with yes. her. Yes, yep. So, okay. Yep. All right, David, thank you. You bet, thank you. Any further questions from the commission? I have none. I have none. If not, then I'll entertain a motion. I move to set the date of July 23rd, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. for a public hearing to consider condemnation of 1033 North 17th Place, I think. Is that correct? Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Next item on the agenda is discussions. Item A under discussion is to discuss COVID-19 expenses and potential impact on future revenue. Mayor, our uh, admin team has been meeting quite a bit on different plans, on different scenarios and things like that. One thing that we need to make an informed decision is so we got to have the data. Um, Lacey has done some preliminary uh, financial forecasting and then she can explain to you what she has put together and also um, what, what data points she's gonna need to really see a trend of, of what direction we're going, because none of us know what this economic impact of the, this pandemic is going to be in the short term or the long term. So I'll turn it over to Lacey for her report. Thanks. Um, first, I'll start off with, um, you all had asked me of what we had spent so far related to COVID. Um, so I, David has been keeping a tracking spreadsheet for me and of, of invoices that have been turned into us, we have incurred uh, $51,707 worth of, of expenses directly due to COVID. Um, Lacey, excuse me, do you have a handout? I I, I, I just cannot put this, see anything. I that. just put this one together today, so this isn't actually on the... PowerPoint. Um, Kelly, did you happen to print um, that I email that I me, sent you? Let me send it to uh, Brian and ask him to print those. Okay. I don't have the one she's talking about now, but I, we can get these other ones for you. Thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, the, the expenses that the city has incurred thus far are, you know, there's a a variety of different categories that I would put them in, um, but by far the greatest has been um, supplies. And I, I can send you all the, the tracking spreadsheet after this meeting that, that shows, and by no means is it all inclusive. Um, it's just what I've seen come through this far. Um, and it does not include any payroll related expenses, so any um, non-salaried employees that have had um, you know, done something directly related to that. I have not entered those into these spreadsheets. Um, there were some questions on, you know, what we did have to relocate city offices from the second floor in the basement to the main floor. Um, and the costs that I have to date on that are $7,757.65. We've purchased a couple of computers to enable staff to work from home. Uh, that 
was $6,546.55. And then the supplies, which are, there's a lot of, that's kind of our, our catch-all category. There's a lot in supplies. Um, that has totaled $26,610.71. So, so those three categories are our largest expense categories. On the, the, the supplies, mm -hmm. um, is that, does that include replenishing or is that just out of pocket some of the non-stockpiled? It includes replenishing and we did put in the cost of, of supplies that we have distributed um, to other organizations okay. and agencies. Um, I'm going off of memory, but I believe that was around $15,000 of, of supplies that we had on hand that we either consumed mm -hmm. ourselves or distributed to others. Okay, good. I know that from the conference calls, there's been many times that we've been able to assist other agencies and, you know, it's what, what we've seen is an ideal example of being prepared for an emergency that uh, we've had masks that we could come to the aid when the supplies, the normal route dried up, we were able to step in. I don't know how many times I heard David said, well, how many do you need? And it was never, well, you know, let me see, maybe it was all how many, meaning that the city of Independence was prepared for this type of emergency. And I, I think uh, that's what going out of this, we still need to carry that on and not say, well, we didn't use them all. We still got plenty as we need to look at our costs to replenish so that we are prepared again. That's really made, I think, a difference for our employees and our emergency preparedness departments, the, the PD, the fire, EMS, all to offer at a comfortable level. Maybe hand sanitizer caught us all off guard and uh, disinfectant spray, but you know, overall we've been in really good, good form. So, yeah, yeah, it's uh, amazing how quick you know something like this does add up. And I know it's kind of a struggle to keep current, but this is a a good outline of where we are now on on our out of pocket expenses. Uh, unbudgeted expenses. Yes. And again, I'm, I will share this file with you um, after the meeting. And we, we just keep sure. it up to date. And um, so if you need a, sh a snapshot of time, just let us know. Yeah, just the, the periodic update. That way we have a real time of what's going on in-house and the things that, that you guys are dealing with. Uh, you know, we want to be there to support you and understand how this is going to affect as we go into the budget time and audit and look into the future where we might be that, uh, you know, we keep hearing news media that this could come back in the fall and we definitely want to be prepared and, and know what, what's ahead of us. So. Uh, Questions from the commissioner concerning these items? No. Did you have a revenue impact that you were going to share as well? Yes, yes. I do. But do you want me to wait until the handouts are available? I'm printing them right now. Um, it's whatever you prefer. Yeah. Uh, the rev I do have a, a, a quick question then. The relocation cost includes <laughs> the, uh, the construction of any um, barriers or, or walls or screens that uh, needed to be put in place so that the I, uh, people greeting the public are safe, right? If they, if we have received the invoice, yes. I see. But there are, out, there are invoices that um, we have not seen yet okay. that would go into those costs. That's why we'll need the uh, ongoing information. Yes. Thank you.
And I did email you copies of the projections, so okay. you should have those. Yeah, well. It's always uh, interesting when you look at uh, a job description or the operation that they never really give you training on how to be prepared for a situation like this. And, you know, we look at the, you know, it, it's kind of like one of those cockle burrs where you have the little spiny things that get stuck in your socks when you went out hiking that there's so many points that you can't number them that it's not only the sickness, it's transportation, it's not only uh, hospitality, retail, you know, restaurants, uh, being concerned about how you can protect staff to keep the city functioning. And it's just like you go from one to, a, to another that it's awful, always changing. And you've, about the time you think you've got a grasp on what's going to happen in a schedule, then there's not one, two, but there's 1.5. So, you know, it's true flexibility that how do you, how do you adapt to these situations and, uh, and keep things going without uh, missing something. And it's, it's definitely a challenge for, for staff, <clears throat> for staff to continue through the, the problem solving and, and be kind of gathering around a crystal ball to try and hopefully look where the next problem might be. But, you know, you, you, you see the response of how we've, we've tried to be uh, ahead of the game and even, you know, with the carry out, putting up the barriers to allow <coughs> curb, curb service at our restaurants. And, you know, our, our grant program, although we couldn't do everything, it, it magnified so much from where it, it started. And we see 70, 71, 71. Bus yes. 71 businesses, so. I was successful in killing dead air time. Yeah, that's always, you know, you listen to the radio, which we used to listen to the radio, Wolfman Jack, you know, the Don McCord, the good DJs, and that dead air time on the radio. So I'll turn it since I've sufficiently killed dead air time while we got our copies now. Now, right. Lacey. Well, I, I will start with the ad valorem tax summary, so it's the one that looks like this. <coughs> okay. And and just to preface everything, um, tell you some assumptions and kind of how I based my modeling. Um, I, I based collection reductions on prior year actual amounts by month. So I, I looked at our monthly collections of ad valorem tax and then reduced it by an in increments of 5% from 5 to 25% per month. Um, so what you see on this, this summary page is, um, and I, I also broke it down by, by fund. So if you look at current and delinquent ad valorem tax combined um, for the general fund, it's the very top line. Um, so at a 5% reduction in collections, we would be looking at 1,000, or $128,273.67 at 5%, and then up to at 20%, um, it was $220,075. Um, it was $220,075. So I did that for each of them in that range. And the, the funds that collect ad valorem tax are the general fund, the industrial fund, general fund employee benefit, the library fund, um, liability insurance, and then sometimes the bond and interest fund collects ad valorem, but we did not budget it as such this year. Okay. Um, 
and the the following pages after that summary are just um, the data input that I used and it, it kind of breaks it down just um, if you want to see it in terms of what percentage of that budget is collected um, so for example on that 5% line, it, it says reduction in collections from prior year of 5%, and it shows per month. So um, June is when we get our next large payment of current taxes. Um, a 5% reduction would be $851,534 collected. And if we see that 5% consistent over the, the next two months of collections, which are in September and November, um, we would be looking at a delinquency rate of a, a little over 11%. So that's how this chart reads. And then the following two pages are just that, that level of data for 2019 and 2018 so that you can see what percentage we've collected month over month and the delinquency rates at the end of each year. So for example, 2018, we had a delinquency rate of 12.64%, 2019 of 11.26%, and then a 5%, we, we have collected more to date this year than we had to date last year. Um, so that's why you see at a 5% reduction in collections from last year, you're only looking at a delinquency rate of a little over 11%, which is less than last year. Are there any questions on this summary? So for the ad valorem property tax, the, the reality of how much that's going to be affected, let's say May 18th is the cutoff date by the state, so is it going to be we get our by payment, June? We get our payment in June, so um, this time next month I okay. will hopefully have a, a lot better idea. <clears throat> David, do you know around what time of the month? Okay. So if, then we'll be a little better shaped to know how that has been affected. Uh, yes. Okay. If we move on to do, are there any other questions or can I move to sales tax? And then I'll, I'll kind of summarize of what all of these mm -hmm. dollar amounts mean combined with sales tax and ad valorem sure. tax. So the sales tax, I just took um, the format that you see normally on the, the monthly sales tax reports, and I show that, you know, what we've actually collected through April. And then for May through December, I based off again of 2019 actual amounts, if we saw a 5, 10, 15, 20, or 25 percent reduction in, um, in collections based off of 2019 actuals, what that would mean on a monthly basis. Um, so if you look at just the, if, if you looked at the next page that shows by fund, you can see what those amounts mean for each fund. So, for example, the general fund, we, we budget 1% directly to the general fund, and that is about 1.9 million, and then a quarter percent of the 1% special use sales tax also goes to the general fund, so that is included up there as well. So at a 5% reduction in collections over prior year actual amounts, we would still project to collect $67,738 over our budgeted amount. And that is just because we've been over, um, we've collected more to date than we had last year. Um, and then 
Worst case scenario on this projection is a 25% reduction. And for the general fund, that would equate to $273,760. And so that same logic was applied to the, the two other funds that receive um, sales tax. So the special use sales tax, I broke it down for ADA streets and facilities, and then the educational sales tax gets a 1% um, sales tax as well. And then that lower section that you see, um, just for comparison purposes, I said, you know, what if we just had a straight percentage reduction in budget and it wasn't 5% over each month based off of prior actuals, just a straight 5% cut in our budget up to 25%. So that's what you see there in that next section, next section below, which of course is a lot more drastic. So are there any specific questions on the sales tax revenue analysis? <clears throat> any questions, commissioners? I'm good. Yeah, I think I'm good. I, I need to go back through and, yeah. and look at all this but yeah for right now okay I, I don't think I could formulate a question that would make any <laughs> sense so I'm gonna go back and look at this and come up with a better yeah. question sure I think from all this we're seeing what the projections are and that there is an impact now uh, how are we doing it to prepare for it I'm maybe Kelly, uh, what's the lost revenue going to cause us? What action are we going to have to take then? Uh, I think you mentioned uh, the uh, capital improvement projects have been put on hold until we get a more realistic. Uh, there's been, I think you had mentioned another meeting of a hiring freeze or well we're only hiring those that we have to hire you know we have to hire some people right. replace some positions that we can't do without either because of safety or just keeping things operating um but any that we've been able to hold off on we are holding off on we've also halted our capital projects until we get a better idea of where we are mm -hmm. because if we need to take um, some funds out of the budget that will be the easiest ones to you know put off um, so we've looked at that as well and it's all just going to kind of depend on where we're at and we'll have a better idea as Lacey said in June when she gets that payment of, of what the trend's going to be but I mean um, I'm glad we're on a calendar year on our budget because I'm sure the schools are really struggling trying to adopt a budget that starts July 1st and having very little data so at least we have a, we're going to get a little bit of data, more data than they are, but it's still going to be, the budget is always an 18 month projection into the future. And, um, you know, it's just, you, you don't ever know what that trend's going to be, but hopefully we can get a general idea yeah. at the end of June. And the problem we have this right now, it's not that we had a trend we had to project against. We had a mm -hmm. major breakdown that yes. we we had come along so so the for now we're holding capital improvements which will unless you know, something safety related safety. that we need to evaluate mm -hmm. you know i don't want to put anybody at any risk right. so if there's equipment or different things that we have to go ahead and take care of yeah. or that we need to, to get but if it's safety related or projects and you know that would be something different but pretty much the big stuff we're just holding off um, until we get the data and then mm -hmm. we can make a more informed recommendation okay and next week uh, Wednesday we have a special commission meeting scheduled to discuss capital improvement projects and 
I understand the basis to do that is just to discuss the planning of what could be and then we'll come back as we look at the effect and modify this. So we're making an assumption, let's plan for the future, but once when we have our number, then we'll back it down yes. so that we protect the, the city with the revenue we have and uh, and a and still try to maintain a cash balance uh, in reserve. Mm -hmm. I, I think she looked at that today. Actually, we talked had a conversation about that. I, I did. Um, I'm. I, I looked based off of the first quarter treasurer's report, mm -hmm. um, and we had a 13% a cash reserve in just the general fund um, as of March 31st, which is lower than I would like it to be, um, but not concerning. Yeah, I. It, it seemed like a couple years ago, maybe a little longer, that we allowed our cash reserve to get a little lower than what we wanted so mm -hmm. we did bring that up mm -hmm. and and uh, got a little cushion there uh, the uh, industrial funds water sewer they're pretty stable with collections and our <clears throat> Our um, water and sewer collections are, are actually down from last year, but they have been down for the entire year. Um, so I, I have not seen a huge decrease in, in collections just from what I can say is COVID related, um, but, but overall there is a reduction in collections of water sewer. But we, we are behind in there. We did. Uh, have a, a reserve in both of those. Oh yes, we have in all three funds: yep. sanitation, we do. water, and sewer too. So yes, good. That's that's good. So <clears throat> we really did. We're fortunate that we came in as prepared as we have been. Uh, that's good. Okay, commissioners, any questions for Kelly or for Lacey? Ideally, what uh, percentage of cash reserves would you like to have? What would be a target? I think that the generally what our auditors tell us is three months of expenses on hand, um, which would be about 25%. Well, like 25%. Percent. I see. Okay. Yeah, Lacey, I just wanted to, to say um, thank you for putting all this data together. Uh, I know the projections, and they're only as good as the data that's provided. And in a continuing, fluid, evolving situation that seems to change day by day, um, I know you put a lot of time and effort into it, and, and that does give us uh, a broad picture of you know what we might possibly be looking at. And uh, like you said, June will start giving us an indication of where we might fall at, but at least we'll, we have an idea of, of what we could be possibly facing by then. So uh, I appreciate your hard work. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We are very fortunate to have the financial team that we have right now, especially during this crisis. So it's been very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, uh, there's so much that, is unexpected and to be able to go in as organized and as strong and uh, and have the patience. I know I've asked you numerous times and you never hollered at me. <laughs> you, you know, you never, uh, you know, you just, well, I'm working on it and yeah, I, you know, I'm very positive and it's, because that was one of my concerns and uh, you came through. Appreciate the information and the detail. Just keep us informed and we'll see what we have to do as we head into budget season. So thank you, Lacey. Yep. And um, while we're on, on COVID, do you, 
want to talk about 1.5 or do you have anything? I have it. Uh, I have a slide coming up on a reopening plan. I thought I'd cover it then cover if it that's then. okay. Okay. That's, that's good. So let's see. We'll move on then if there's no further questions for the revenue impact. We'll go to reports. Uh, a reminder of the May 20 2020 Special Commission meeting at 9 a.m. to discuss future capital projects. Uh, also, uh, at that meeting, we'll have the public hearing. Yes, and Lacey heard back from the state, and we the one on the 19th is a no-go, so it will be on the 20th for the CDBG. Um, grant and if you have any specific questions on that grant she's been working on that and then the other item is to discuss the future capital projects as you talked about previously um, which was on our budget schedule so okay. Lacey do you want to review that grant briefly um, I can yes so this I don't remember if we've talked about this in a meeting um, not yet, but it is being offered in three sections, a micro grant, an economic development grant, and a food assistance grant. Um, the micro grant is the one to five employees. Economic development is six to 50 employees. Um, and the requirements that the state is enforcing on those is that 51% of the jobs retained must meet LMI income for the household. So not wages paid to that employee, but the employee household income. So I would imagine that will be fairly restrictive. Um, so, so businesses will have to, there, there is an income verification form um, that you have to fill out to to be granted the funds. Um, at what point in the process we do that verification, I'm not sure. That's something that we'll have to talk about. Um, but but that in itself is fairly restrictive for businesses, and that is a federal rule. So there's nothing that we could have done to get around that. Um, the meal support program, um, our community meets. LMI standards, so we are we are a low to moderate income community, so we automatically qualify without surveying. Um, so that does, you know, it's good and bad, meaning that we have a, a large population of, of low income and poverty in our community, but we don't have to jump through the extra hoops that a lot of other communities do to even be able to apply for this. Um, so this would be food assistance for programs like the Summer Lunch Program, Meals on Wheels, um, the Community Access Center, Replenishing Food Banks, and the, the food pantries that are scattered throughout town, um, or, or things like um, the cuff meals or different community meals that, that are put on throughout our community. That's what that funding would be for. And I do plan on submitting this grant right after our, our meeting on Wednesday. Um, April and I are, are working hard on putting the narrative together. And once we have all of the documentation, I'll, I'll actually probably hand it off to David and make him go submit it while we continue with our budget meeting. Um, so, so we should be ready to go on Wednesday. And then the process after that uh, we were told it will be probably 15, a 15-day 15 review period where the state will review applications on an ongoing basis, so uh, likely within 15 days of your submission, we should hear back. And then they stated that there would be about a 10-day turnaround for funds being deposited, and then the, the cities or counties are responsible for um, carrying out the requirements of the grant and, and getting business applications and, and so forth. So businesses will apply directly with the city and they cannot apply through the state. We've gotten a lot of calls of businesses asking how they apply and, and I 
told them I don't know yet, um, but it will be through us and they should not go to the CDBG CV website to apply. So with the, the micro grant, that's for the business? Yes, to... these grants, we can, we can establish the dollar value. Um, the only constraints are you, um, the, the most you can grant for one employee is $25,000, but you can give no more than $30,000 to a single business. Um, so there's quite a bit of flexibility um, and discretion given to the cities and counties. And the sole proprietors, at-home businesses, all of those are, are eligible through the state's requirements. Again, the cities and counties can choose to impose additional restrictions if they choose. Um, and the way that would work would be, um, you know, for example, if you are a sole proprietor, you would count as one employee even though you may not get wages and you would have to meet the LMI requirements. So the, the CDBG is actually a circuit to get the money in the employees hands for low and moderate income individuals that are still employed or laid off or? So these funds will go to the businesses, mm -hmm. not the employees, right. but the goal is employee retention. Okay. So to compensate for, for loss keep revenue them. that and, would and cover keep, wages. Yep, to keep those employees on. To the, the goal is to, to keep the workforce employed. The low to moderate yes. income employees, not yes. the executives or? Correct. Okay. And then... The meals program just goes strictly to the uh, food banks, the food, the organizations that distribute food to the needy. It, it will come to the city and then the city right. will distribute it um, based off of some sort of application okay. process to those. It has to be a not-for-profit entity um, on the, the meal supply side. Um, and on the business side, it must be a for-profit business that has been impacted by COVID. Okay, good. Sounds like a pretty good response time mm -hmm. for review yep. and turnaround. Okay, good. Any questions? I'm good. Yeah, the, the, the grant money that, that we were looking at is, <coughs> is it? Three or four hundred thousand dollars. We're looking at maybe. It's three hundred thousand okay. dollars for the business portion of it, okay. and then we will be applying for one hundred thousand dollars for the food assistance. Okay. So a total of four hundred thousand dollars. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Lacey. Uh, ADA project update. Mayor, we just wanted to give you a quick update on the 2018 ADA project. Uh, we have some pictures for you right quick. This is the Annie May sidewalk, uh, which it is completed. You'll notice the sand there as they're getting ready to restripe and put in the ADA stalls in the parking lot. Uh, we also, I think the next picture, uh, you can see more of the sidewalk. There will be a handrail there on the uh, ledge that Ironworks is currently putting. <laughs> And then that one will be complete. Uh, the park project is complete as far as the sidewalk. We have uh, a striping crew out putting in the ADA markings on the parking stalls. So, and we have some dirt out there that the Graham construction is going to help with some of the ponding areas in the playground. So, have that left to do out there. And this is over on Fifth Street, a part of the overlay project that we did and some of the ADA uh, ramps that had to be put in because of that overlay, which has been completed. We have some markings on there that are going to be done in the next couple of weeks for those stalls. And this is just a couple snapshots there on the right would be at Montgomery County. Uh, we partnered with Montgomery County 
to assist on that ramp, and then the Fifth Street was related to a complaint for <clears throat> accessible access for somebody that's wheelchair confined. So that Fifth Street has been completely done. Uh, the left picture is just another one of the park. Okay. And the left picture there is uh, right across the street from the courthouse. And on the right one, we are partnered with the VFW. Uh, this is in the parking lot across from the old city hall. Uh, we have the ramp in. Uh, they will be sandblasting and putting in the correct striping for the two ADA stalls there. And they should in the next week, if the rain will stop, be working out front. Uh, we're doing a sidewalk. Uh, VFW then is having Ironworks build their ramp, so that should be completed down there here within the next couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, this is over on H Street at the uh, apartments at 123 uh, West Main. Uh, we have the ramp completed. We will now work on the striping and putting the uh, two stalls there and restriping that and signage for the residents. A part of the agreement we have with Colon S Rays to provide parking there. So. That project is 95% completed, just need to do some striping and some signage and we'll be done with there. The another one is uh, downtown. Uh, we fixed a sidewalk that had displaced by the uh, corporate building and uh, uh, that worked out well there. We still have some problems with the bricks when we have time mm -hmm. there in all of those bricks. Uh, we yeah. need to get the sand replaced and get those leveled back out. But. Uh, I believe in the manager update, Kelly will tell you about some of the, what the status on the rest of the projects are. But we're pretty much close to 2018 being wrapped up and completed. The corner at uh, Annie Mays, were the ramps at the street correct or did they have some problems with them? I was going to look it up to, to see and ran out of time. Do you remember? Back up to that picture. Are you talking? At the intersection, the north. At the intersection, the they are not corner. correct. Yeah. And in fact, Leonard, you, you, if you, when you go down there, you'll notice where they tied in this exis mm -hmm. existing to the intersection. It's not at the correct slope. Yeah. It's off. It's just a small, probably 24 inch piece in there. But the reason is when we do the downtown, that whole intersection has to be fixed there on that corner. Okay. So that was a plan. I know we talked to Trans Systems about including that where they were going to work up to it to possibly yeah. include it, but the decision yeah. was to yeah. wait and yeah, wait do all when downtown. Yeah, wait we do the whole downtown and Again. get it then. Yeah. So. Okay. The work at the middle school where that hole was, is the school completing their ramp? Yes, they are. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I've seen the contractor over there this last week yeah yep okay any questions from the commissioner on the ADA project update I'm good okay. I'm good okay great thank you David um, sales tax report Um, indicated that we we collected 23.6 percent more than April of 2019 and um, so sales tax was up significantly and that that has helped us um, going forward that should lessen the impact um, of what we're seeing right now um, with four months collected we've collected 35.7 percent of our budget um, and fiscal year 20 collections through April are up 5.1% over fiscal year 19. That's good. Yep. We'll just have to <laughs> wait and see, won't we? Yes. Okay. Any questions concerning sales tax report? No. Good news. Yep. Thank you. I'm good. Okay. Uh, city reopening plan update. This plan looked really good about two hours before the meeting. <laughs> uh, things kind of changed with the uh, governor's latest updates. We had um, 
actually had a meeting with with the pool folks on that and terry's on the line and he can give you an update where we're at on the pump terry are you there yes i'm here go ahead terry um the pool pump we're moving along uh i had had uh, talked to the parts supplier for for the pump parts a couple of days ago he assured me that the parts would be shipped out on the 19th which is next tuesday and we anticipate to see those in by the end of the week or or monday of the, the following week uh sake tam is uh manufacturing a park force here in town and uh, we get that all together we should be able to have that pump put back together and reinstalled in the pool the last week of may or the latest the first week of june and uh, like kelly said we had a meeting with the rec uh, city rec and, and we have a full committee and uh, everybody's on the same page on that uh i think maybe like I say with the governor's announcement <laughs> things may be held up a little bit but that's beyond our control so basically um the cool pool committee had decided that that they would need until uh, june 15th to open up to get their lifeguards in place and get everything operating which would be phase four that also would allow for the proper social distancing because they anticipate they could have more than 90 people at the pool and at that time phase four was estimated to be starting uh, june 15th uh, with the latest phase 1.5 that's being pushed out um, another couple of weeks on that so you're looking towards the end of june uh, rather than june 15th so uh, we will have to go back and reevaluate our plan uh, once we have time to go through this um, material i did make you copies of the latest phase 1.5 and then jim kelly sent me the executive order which i also made copies and i also emailed this information to you so basically we have to go back to the drawing board and see how this affects what we had planned to open um, because they've left that maximum number at, at 10 uh, that was in phase one, which um, originally we thought we were going to go to 30. So that's gonna, going to make some changes. So um, do you have any questions? Or maybe David might be able to answer some questions specific to the phase 1.5. We haven't had a lot of time to dig into it too much just because we just got this thing just a little while before the meeting we were feeling pretty good we had a plan to open the pool and we're just going along and then and then this came up and that's gonna modify some things for us so how long will this phase 1.5 extend to did you say till the end of june well the phase four which was originally supposed to start june 15th right. will, will most likely be uh june 29th i believe is the date phase four starts okay so basically it just pushes everything back a couple weeks so and we're going to go through all of this and um you know make a new reopening plan and and have to squeeze another column in there for 1.5 and see what what's modified and what's not so um it's not just going to affect the city it's going to affect you know some other businesses and things as well as you can see of um you know that are not allowed to open or restricted. So 1.5 will be another 14 days in duration. It it appears that's about what it is, correct? All of these phases have been about two week period. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any questions regarding the city's reopening plan? Not at this time. Next is a 2020 census update. Well, I have I have some more bad news. <clears throat> Can you advance to the next slide? Uh, Cherryville's beating us. <laughs> what? 
So they, they inched up, we're at 57.5% of response on the census and they're at 57.7. So they have taken the lead. So we, we need to get our people to fill out their census because yeah. we want to get, uh, take the lead again. So that's kind of where we're at on our little census contest. And it yeah. doesn't take very long. They can go no. on the website, they can call, call the phone number and it's a lot of easy ways to do it. And, uh, just encourage everybody to fill out that census. It's a lot of money that we could leave on the table if we don't mm -hmm. have a good response. So just wanted to cover that. And then um, the next one was the letter from the Planning Commission regarding updating the comp plan. They've asked for this pretty much every year for the last <coughs> several years. They uh, requested to actually draft a letter so that's what that is. They understand with the COVID situation that it's, right. um, you know, it's, it's, it's just something that uh, we all don't know how that's going to affect us. So, but they just wanted to make sure that you kept it in mind. Is what being proposed a total revision or just an update? Well, no, we need to basically updating the plan will be a new plan. It's a 1982 plan. So I don't know what you could salvage from it other than, I mean, the policies, policies and objectives and things like that are really well written. It's just all the data is completely outdated. It doesn't look like with the, uh, the population situation that we're experiencing and growth that there's not gonna change much in areas but maybe revising, doing new counts of housing and traffic counts maybe, but. Uh, Probably the biggest influence on changing the mapping of the plan and where growth develops and traffic patterns is <clears throat> when the schools made modifications to what their locations, right. that really affects your traffic patterns. It did. So that, that was probably one of our major changes. You know, we always had this, highways were always in the same place, so you had those traffic patterns. Um, but when the schools moved, um, that really changes things up. Mm -hmm. And then you need to look at, you know, there's streets that we could extend in the future, things like that. So I think uh, on those levels, it would help you identify maybe where you wanted to extend streets and things like that, and a lot of it is the major changes is the schools. Okay. Um, finally, Chief. In this item, um, I had a commissioner <coughs> asking some questions where we were at, so I asked Jerry if he could report sure. on it. Well, after the, well, now it slid off of there, where to go? Um, there we go. After the last meeting, or in the last meeting, it was, uh, Mayor, you suggested that we just sit back and let the citizens take the lead if they would desire change. That's what we did. I've gotten one email from a resident that did not like the parking on one side of the street. That's it. And I checked that resident on pictometry, and they have off-street parking. Uh, did a survey of parking on pictometry as well. I, and. Uh, there are four addresses on the entire length of 6th Street. There is one address on the entire length of 5th Street. And there is one address on the entire link, length of 2nd Street that appear to me to not have access to off-street parking. So you've got six residences there that may not have the off-street parking. And I did not go through and confirm all that with the drive through It would have taken quite a bit of time. Since the signs were erected, uh, I tagged one car. It was illegally parked, which is what drew my attention to it. I did not tag it for tow because of the parking, obviously, because it was a brand new deal. It only been in effect for about a week or two. But the car was illegally licensed in violation of state law and city ordinance, so I tagged it for tow, and it, it went away, um, which is the goal. I... S there is one residence on, I believe it's 4th Street, that I saw violated the parking signs twice. 
I, I did not make contact yet. I wanted to see how that would play out over time. Um, I have had one or two residents that, you know, one didn't like the stop signs, one felt like the parking signs were an eyesore in their yard, or the sign in their yard was an eyesore. Um, and that is pretty much the extent of feedback so far. Okay. Commissioners? Jerry, do you plan to uh, reach out in some kind of formal way, like a, a follow-up to, uh, to the conversation we had uh, at the previous commission meeting that we, we ha asked you back to, to, to talk about this? Uh, it seems like that uh, maybe there was some misunderstanding that we could clear up about the, the motivation behind it or something like that. Is there, is there anything that you had planned to do with regard to that? No, at, at the mayor's suggestion to uh, let the, you know, if the neighborhood wanted to um, come together and, and make some points, then, then we would address it at that time. And I felt like that, that was probably a better idea than mine. So I, I haven't moved forward on any follow-ups. There's Which, time. We can give it a little more time. Right. Yes. And like I said, I mean, I've, you know, I even a, a buddy of mine that was giving me a hard time about it, I haven't heard back from him yet on it either. So I, I, I think it was one of those situations where it looks like a terrible, monstrous change is coming at you, and then you come in and the waves, you know, get your socks wet and we move on. Uh, I just don't, it must not have been uh, as impactful as it was initially anticipated as my guess. But again, you know, I, I'm certainly willing to sit and visit with anybody. Uh, the one, the one email I did get, I, I let the residents know that, you know, you're the, this is the only feedback I've gotten. I've been monitoring the parking. I have not told the police department to go in and start enforcing it yet. I've asked them to take a warning status to educate the neighborhood. And, um, you know, if I get more feedback, we'll certainly schedule a meeting. But at this time, I don't, doesn't seem to be the interest to continue looking into it. So prioritize, move on to the next projects. And, you know, particularly the strategic plan has been, uh, I haven't moved forward on it. So I've kind of prioritized a strategic plan over going back and revisiting this. And there are some other traffic complaints around town. Uh, I'm not anticipating jumping on those projects. I want to give this project more time to see how it's absorbed uh, because I don't, you know, it doesn't do any good to come in and put a stop sign in this one intersection. We need to address entire areas to be impactful. Otherwise, I think it will create more problems and a false sense of security, and then cars will start sliding into each other because they think they're stop signs when there's really not. So, um, but I am, you know, staying in touch with the, with the requests as they come in and going and looking at them. And, but I think now may be a time to kind of sit back and, you know, budget issues as well with the COVID virus. This was an expensive change. Um, not terribly expensive, but it, you know, it's, it all costs money and you, you spend $5,000 or $3,000 here, you know, you can bankrupt yourself just with little projects all over town. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, I think that this is a good time to sit back and see, give these mm -hmm. folks some time to really determine if they want to make a change or not. Thank you, Jerry. Mm -hmm. Before COVID hit, there was a, a survey team coming through. Uh, I forget which, what the name of it was. Uh, we had some meetings scheduled and they were canceled. Did they go ahead with the, the survey? And, uh, you know. Commissioners. They scheduled appointments to survey them. Oh, March. the uh, the audit, the, the operational audit. audit. I need to. <clears throat> I'm very disappointed in 1.5. <laughs> hmm. um, I'm sure the entire state is. Uh, I was actually going to reach out to them next week and say, "Hey, I I anticipate that we can start working with you guys in June." I have now, with the understanding that one of them is based out of New York, so I. I don't know what the situation is in New York. It may be not an option yet. So the, as far as the operational audit goes, um, I've been working with Lacey to ensure that I still have the budget to get things 
uh, that we know need to be fixed mm -hmm. up. So she assures me we, we do have the budget to get that going. The issue is uh, reopening the city and, and getting with contractors and having them come in and get things set up for the, so that we're in compliance. Okay. But yes, I, I, I got a call from the company Lexapol this week and I was really eager thinking that that was gonna be some follow up and uh, it was a different part of the company. So it wasn't what I wanted it to be. I wasn't for sure if they were able to come and, and do the audit and just bypass the, the actual interviews since it seemed like a really critical audit for you. I think they could do the, I mean, as far as the interview, it is a critical audit. Yeah. Uh, for sure. I, I appreciate you guys uh, having the foresight to understand that. Um, I don't know why they couldn't do the phones, you know, do the interviews over the phone. The, Definitely. The pre- there was quite a packet of pre-audit stuff. We scheduled the audit. It was in uh, right when the emergency really started firing off and getting serious, so like 18th of March or something like that. And uh, we had phone meetings with them for like, from like January and February and March. And then uh, internally we had gathered everything that they requested, all the documentation, the numbers, the explanations, and sent everything. And then of course the things that we knew would be a shortcoming we sent all that to them, and uh, they called me that, I think it was Tuesday or Wednesday, and said, Jerry, the plane's leaving. We need to know if we're coming or not. And I said, boys, you better not come. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, turned out to be the right decision for all of us, I think. But, yeah, I'm ready to get it going. We need to get that, get that going. Yeah, it seemed like an important uh, audit that we definitely like. Kelly mentioned some of the things, life safety, audits like that are pretty critical for performance and protection of our departments, the, the PD, fire, so. Like what, what frustrates me and again, the entire world, I guess, with this pandemic <coughs> is it, it would have been nice to have that audit now mm -hmm. as we move into the budget season. So I'd, you know, that would have really helped out. So this may put us back to 2022 before we can really make some impactful changes yeah. and, and drive the budget, unfortunately. But, you know, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, it may not be anything that's terribly cost prohibitive and we can just power through. Well, whatever we can do to support you in it, let us know. I appreciate that. And I'll, I'll get with them next week and, and uh, follow up with Kelly on that and she can okay. let you know what's happening. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Chief. Welcome. Next item, municipal court update. We have a resumed having court. We're actually having it down here where we can space everybody out, and it is uh, the once a week, which is the schedule we wanted to go to anyway instead of the three times a week. We have interviewed uh, candidates for the position, and we're working on getting that finalized, and we hope to have um, some news for you on that soon. Okay. Thank you. Uh, city board meetings, commissioners, have any questions about the board minutes? I've reviewed them. I have no questions. I have no questions. Next item is the city manager's comments. Uh, yes, we met with um, Sean Turner this week on the Peter Pan phase three. That's complete except for the sod and striping. And as you know, at, at, we asked them to hold off because uh, we didn't want the road closed and the detour signs up and things during when everything was um, going on with the pandemic and, and having issues with that. The contractor can complete that work under traffic, so we anticipate that we'll be coming back sometime in June and getting that finished. On the, the striping, I noticed what is out there, is that just temporary? Because they've got you've got a turn lane coming up to the south entrance into Labette, and then it there's a stripe right in the middle mm -hmm. it seemed like that you'd want to turn continue your turn lane to the north ambulance entrance and then transition to two lane north of that entrance so that the ambulance coming in could mm -hmm. have protection of right. the traffic I will check with Sean Turner to be sure. It's my understanding the striping crew has not mobilized yet. Is that your understanding also, David? 
Yeah. So. Okay. It sure didn't make a lot of sense with mm -hmm. striping. There we've got a nice wide roadbed that allows for a turn lane, and mm -hmm. then it's eliminated. Right. So we'll, we'll I'll ask about that okay. for sure. Um, then the West Main uh, project east of Peter Pan to the West City limits, mill and overlay, uh, that's scheduled to be let by um, on June 4th. So that's the process on that one. Uh, the ADA um, phase four, the remainder um, items to be completed are the uh, VFW Church on Irving and the 2019 overlay ramps. And uh, then the uh, KDOT came into town and met with uh, Sean Turner and Mike Passeur on the our clip app, C clip applications. This is something they do. They do, do a site visit as part of their uh, review of those grants. Um, Chestnut from Penn to Ninth and Penn Avenue north of Taylor were um, those two projects that they reviewed that were previously submitted by the city. And can you go to the next one? Um, the West Maple Cost Share grant uh, resubmittal is due uh, Monday. We received 15 letters of support, which I was very happy with had a very great response. That's one thing KDOT told us that, that would help us to reapply. And of course the product, our project was modified based on taking some curb and gutter out at, a, at some locations. So we have a revised uh, price and actually the mayor signed the green, grant application. And so that will be sent off when tomorrow or Monday? Tomorrow. tomorrow. So um, that's the status on that and the next one. And then um, back on our strategic plan, this whole pandemic kind of uh, stalled us a little bit on our updates and things like that. Um, our staff did a great job this week getting their updates caught up. So I ran you a new report. I thought it was important that you had that before you started your budget work session on the 20th. Um, so um, I made copies for you of that. Um, so I have not posted the dashboard on it on the website yet. I kind of was holding off because we were so far behind in our updates. Um, now that what they are caught up, we could go ahead and publish that. Um, or we could wait till we get through this crisis because I can tell you there's a lot of things that are um, delayed just based on our priorities have shifted during this pandemic. So a lot of the things we had planned on working on, we were spending most of our time um, kind of in crisis management. So I just wanted to give okay. you an update on that. And that's all I have, unless you have questions for me. Okay, any questions for, Oops, sorry. Any questions for Kelly? No. Okay. I'm good, thank you. Next item is commissioner comments. Uh, Commissioner Hayes, do you have any? I asked uh, earlier this evening that we consider uh, or take a look at the work session on June the 17th that had, uh, that would be our normal work session. I will be out of town on that day and I've asked to move that to June the 10th. So, we'll, so that is something for your uh, consideration and, uh, and just uh, Okay. As you look at your calendar for June, see if the 10th will work for you. Okay. And uh, I didn't bring my calendar. Maybe uh, next Wednesday we'll have that special work session. We can look at it. If it's about, okay. Go ahead. About it then. Yeah. Change. Okay. Great. Okay. Commissioner. You, Susie, any no, I, I don't have any comments. Okay. And neither do I. So public uh, concerns, uh, we have no requests. And executive session, um, I'll say I'd like to make a motion for executive session for the review and discussion of city manager applications pursuant to the non-elected personnel exception KSA 754319 B1. Uh, the meeting will resume at 7 uh, 40 in the Civic Center. Do I have a second? 
Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Just do an update on uh, the COVID-19 situation. David. Good evening. Uh, we continue to work uh, every day on the COVID-19. Uh, as you know, phase 1.5, and I'm bringing up my uh, picture of that so we can talk about it here for just a second. What little we know about the 1.5 phase that the governor has enacted is that she's going to hold the gatherings to 10 individuals and that will continue till the end of the month. Uh, barber shops, hair salons, nail salons, tattoo parlors, tanning salons, gyms and fitness centers to reopen as planned. However, salons and barber shops will be by appointment. Gyms and fitness centers won't be allowed to have group classes or use their locker rooms for anything other than bathroom facilities. So I believe like the dance studio, this probably is going to delay them opening back up till the 1st of June. Bars, nightclubs, bowling alleys would remain closed until at least June 1st. Summer camps, fairs, and festivals would not be allowed until June 15th. And this could affect potentially some activities in the park. Uh, I believe the, what's the band's name, Kelly? The, oh, the Mid-Continent Band. Mid -continent Band was thinking about getting started, so this may delay them a little longer to get started in the park. Uh, Summer camps, fairs, and festivals would not be allowed until June 15th. Uh, she added some stuff in there about high school graduation allowed if, and indoor ceremonies are limited to 10 people at a time, or you could do an, excuse me, an outdoor ceremonies are allowed either with people six feet apart in a large space or a drive-through event, cars pull up, the uh, student gets out, walks across, gets back in the car, and drives off. Uh, at this point, public gatherings of 30 people will be June 1st. Public gatherings of 90 people will be June 15th. And then phase out will be June 29th. So at this point, that is what is happening with COVID. Uh, this will require us to review all of our uh, plans that we had in place. We still do plan on opening City Hall Monday at 8 a.m. Uh, we will limit the lobby to no more than 10 people at a time with social distancing. Uh, lobby hours will be from 8 to noon and from 1 to 5. So that is going to be a change uh, at City Hall clerk's office, lobby hours are from 8 a.m. to noon, closed from noon to 1, and open from 1 to 5 p.m. starting Monday. If you come to City Hall and you need to see staff or you may have an appointment, you would come to the city clerk's office, uh, and then you we have a meeting room to meet with the public. It is divided by a... a div Fighter glass so you will sit on one side and the city employee will be on the other side uh, per the governor's policy we will check your temperature prior to you entering our facility if you have a hundred point four temperature or greater we would ask that you would leave and then return after your fever has been absent for three days so uh, meeting with city staff can be arranged starting on Monday and we will meet with people and be able to help you with applications and permits and other things that you may need to do. And you will also have access to the clerk's office. Please look at our webpage. Uh, there are many options to access the city uh, and pay your water bills, uh, tickets, 
uh, apply for permits and applications online. Uh, if one thing COVID has done is made us more social media and electronic savvy, and we continue to work to improve. Uh, if we can get past COVID, I know Kelly has plans to improve our web web page and to make it even more user friendly. Uh, other things happening in the city, uh, the city staff continues to work on a daily basis to prepare for opening. Barb in the park is working around the clock, uh, getting things ready. I mean, we would like to make those opportunities to ride the train, play miniature golf, uh, all of those opportunities available as soon as possible. Uh, what we thought might have been June soon uh, could possibly be passed out and Kelly will be updating our latest information probably sometime late tomorrow, you think, Kelly, once we've had a chance to review the governor's plan and discuss it with our COVID pandemic team, uh, we'll be updating openings. Uh, we're still planning on opening up the zoo, correct, Kelly? Yes, that is in that is in the plan. So starting, and that is on Monday, you'll be able to enter the zoo. And do you remember what the hours were going to be, Kelly? Uh, The zoo will be nine to five. Nine to five, so the zoo will be open. The start only thing that will be closed is the Stevens Building. Our restaurants, we can encourage. Uh, we were very pleased to see our sales tax for April report come in good. Uh, we can, can continue to encourage our local uh, residents to shop local. Uh, you still have many options with all of our restaurants, whether that be dine-in, carry-out, uh, delivery, and our retail shops. Uh, we, again, can encourage everybody to shop local, keep those sales tax dollars local, help us during this COVID uh, time and budgets as we all work to make it through these difficult times. If anybody has any questions, um, email Lacey, and her email is LaceyL at independencekas.gov, and that's L A C E Y L at independencekas.gov. And I'll put that in the comments on the Facebook um, in case you want to ask her any questions on the CDBG grant. If anybody has any other questions, um, if you want to enter them. Other things happening in town, our library is, oh, looks like our commission is back. Our library will be opening for curbside deliver service here. I believe it's next week, isn't it, Kelly? Yes. Yes. Uh, so on the 18th. On the 18th, so you'll be able to uh, get the books and they will be bringing them out to your vehicle. With that, we'll let our commission back. We're now back in session, and there is no action to be taken from executive session. So with that, the next item on the agenda is adjournment, and I will entertain a motion. I move that we adjourn. Second. Motion is second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Motion carried. Meeting is adjourned.